If it's all right with the organizers, I'm gonna um, scrap my uh, memorized uh, presentation because this morning there's something has happened that's different than, as I recall, prior meetings of this group. And uh, Levi, it's fair to say most of the scientific meetings, Kim, that we've gone to this year, and that is pervasive throughout the opening remarks through the last four talks has been the word cure. And you might be surprised that in the basic science world that I live in, we almost never talk about cure at our major meetings. We talk about progress, we talk about genetics, we talk about chemistry. We almost never talk about cure. And I, sitting here, I'm wondering why, why that is. Is it because we're so rigorous and we know how hard it will be and what it will take to assemble the building blocks that lead to cure? Um, is it that we overpromised in the 60s and 70s and we feel badly about that? Is it that many of us are not just scientists but doctors too and we are at the bedside providing our, our best and realistic uh, options for patients to help them live out their lives to the, the greatest possible um, uh, reward? Um, you know, but it's interesting to me because at the national meetings, we never talk about cure, and that might surprise you, but what shouldn't surprise you is that in our lab meetings, we talk about it all the time. I, had a, I run a lab at Dana-Farber now um, that is a little bit chemistry, the science of making drug molecules, shown here, a little bit biochemistry, the science of fashioning the drug molecule for its molecular target, these targets that Levi teaches us need drugs, and a little bit cancer biology. Do these medicines that we make, do these molecules that we make function like medicines? And at our lab retreat, I, I asked the group, raise your hand if you think you're working, that your project will lead to a cure for cancer. And about 60% of the scientists in my 24-person lab raised their hands. And I was furious because I know 100% of their projects could lead to a cure for cancer, but they don't. When patients come to our clinics and we see them, they come hoping to hear the word cure or curable, that there will be an option for them, like, like my dad hoped when he had pancreatic cancer, and that word did not enter into that conversation. The conversation turns. When scientists come to cancer research, they come in hoping to cure cancer. The graduate students at Harvard that I'll talk to at noon will arrive here hoping to contribute to cure. But often in science, the conversation turns. A huge part of cancer research and clinical cancer medicine is focused on what can we do. And this is for good reason. It was with these crude therapeutic tools that Steve Salen dragged the cure rate of acute lymphoblastic leukemia from 40% to 90%. What can we do today with the tools we have is very powerful information. But the doomsday scenario is that we don't have the tools needed to cure cancer that we now understand in this last revolutionary epoch of cancer science and cancer medicine, led by Levi Garraway and his colleagues, that over the last 10 years, we have a molecular, maybe atomic, understanding of cancer. We know the genes that go wrong. We know why people have cancer. We know the way it manifests. We understand the pattern of spread. And we hand over this information to our clinical investigators, like Ken Anderson, and then we give them toxins, and we give them feathers, and we give them serendipity as our therapeutic response to this information. We have learned over the last 10 years more about cancer than we've learned over the past 100. And what we know now is there are two million somatic mutations, alterations that can go wrong, things that can go wrong in the genome that can be found in cancers. And maybe 500 of these actually contribute to the pathogenesis of this disease. They cause cancer, these gene changes. But against that number of 500 targets, we have just 15 medicines. And so um, I wasn't here at the time, but I'm betting Ed Benz did the math back in 2003 with Stan Korsmeyer, and they saw this on the horizon and they said, how will we respond to this information once it's in hand a decade from now? Because this disparity between the drugs we need and the drugs we have suggests two things. One, that we may not as yet have the therapeutic technologies needed to make the therapeutics that will cure cancer. And secondly, maybe the, whole, maybe the way we're discovering drugs is inadequate. Maybe there's something wrong with our, our approach, which couldn't be more collaborative. It couldn't be more innovative. Um, 
but, but maybe there's something wrong with the way. Maybe it's underproductive. And so they, they did something at the time that I think was very entrepreneurial. They brought chemists, um, scientists that make drug molecules into the world's biggest, best, and most productive cancer medicine and cancer biology environment. Um, there's a show on MTV called The Real World, where they take people from different worlds and they put them in an apartment together, and you can pretend like you don't know what show I'm talking about, but you've all seen it. <laughs> and, um, and, and when this happens, chaos ensues. Um, and I think there was a non-zero chance that that would happen, because this facility that, that tested more cancer molecules than probably any other institute in, the, in all of the cancer world had never made one of its own. What would happen? when chemists with their explosive molecules would be on floors with biologists. And so they hired three chemists. And after I trained as a cancer doctor, I guess frustrated by the quality and creativity of our cancer substances, I went back to retraining chemistry at Harvard with Stu Schreiber um, and had a chance to come back to Dana-Farber to do chemistry. Um, we have no business making drugs at Dana-Farber at this time, um, but the nice thing about drug discovery in academia is that people have very low expectations of us. And so, um, uh, and we have no restrictions. Things that are very hard from when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry here are very easy. It is very easy to share our reagents, our techniques, our tools, our insights. We have access to luminaries like all of the physicians and scientists in this room for a cup of coffee. We can download their most precious insights. This information is hard to get um, in the pharmaceutical industry. And so what Ed did is he created not only the capacity to make new breakthrough drug molecules, but the culture was already um, shovel ready for therapeutic science. Now, I will say that to give this talk today is too early. We are five years into our program, but you are owed, because many of you have supported this work, um, an interim progress report on this project. Can Dana-Farber make therapeutics? We are a training institution. We have recruited to our three labs 60 um, trainees in science. They will be the next generation of therapeutic science our way, openly, innovative. Not what can we do, what can't we do. Uh, we have um, published uh, 300 papers among the three labs, and I'm proud to say most of them are with other labs in other parts of the world. We have created 50 new prototype drugs that we, we don't hide secretly in our labs. We get them out there at the first possible moment. They've circled the globe eight or 900 times. Molecules created here are studied everywhere. This isn't crowdsourcing, this is open sourcing. This isn't, I have a problem, can you solve it? This is, I have a solution, what's your problem? Um, from this work, um, these 50 molecules, they're not all drugs. And we expect that. Our science is no different from that in pharma. Um, but as these molecules bubble up, from that pool, eight new drugs have emerged, six of which are in human clinical testing right now, three of which at Dana-Farber. In five short years, for well under the estimated $2.6 billion it costs the pharmaceutical industry to make a drug, we have transitioned small molecules from our organic chemistry fume hoods to the Yawkey building for human clinical investigation. And I will tell you here today that in just the last three months, we've started to see remarkable responses to two of these medications. We are not a drug company, but we have learned from this experimental exercise over the last three years that Dana-Farber, the Longwood Avenue, and the Boston area, and now with the availability of Skype and Dropbox, the world of academic science is a powerful and fertile place for the development of the next generation of breakthrough therapeutics. This conversation comes back again to cure because these medicines, they may not be curative, but armed with these new tools that incisively respond to the genetic challenges that Levi gives us, this culture that lives today with Steve and Ken Anderson, who without the ability to cure myeloma, has dragged the, 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 um, the ability to live with myeloma from three months to seven to 10 years. What can these innovators do with more powerful tools? So based on this progress, um, it's very exciting that in the next um, three months, we will move into state-of-the-art uh, drug discovery space at the Longwood Center.
And I encourage you in January and February to come and visit us and thank you for supporting um, this experiment and our ideas.